we had planned a trip uh, in 2020 that fell apart because of the pandemic. And then with Liz staying on and joining us as plant recorder, she did a, a fabulous job making the connections with all the people that you'll see today during our slideshow. Um, but let's go to the next slide. So this is just a little bit about how we all, Holly Hill Arboretum, got involved with sororities. And it goes back to the late 60s, actually, Polly receiving seed of Stewardia Veda, the mountain camellia. And she was one of the first individuals in the United States, honestly, to grow the native Stewardias. And so it started in the early 60s with Oveda and then went into the early 70s. So Polly, as we know, has these beautiful collections of Asiatic Stewardias, but our focus here was on the native species. The other kind of cool thing that's related to this is our first director, Steve Spomberg, uh, wrote the very first monograph, which is a detailed botanical history and kind of a species description of all known deciduous leaf stewardias. So it included the Asiatic ones, but also the two species that we're looking at today. So we have this very, very rich history of Stewardia, starting with Polly and then extending to Steve. We like to brag about this. <laughs> we have the Plant Collections Network, PCN collection of Stewardia. We share it, we co-hold it with the Arnold Arboretum. One of the interesting things is, is they have a tremendously hard time cultivating the two native species where we can grow them quite well. So we received this very, very early on when I actually was the curator, this designation. It was called the, um, used to be called the National Collection, but it's an accredited collection through American Public Garden Association. It basically means your devoting your energies curatorially, uh, research-wise, and other ways to obtain what we call wild source germplasm. And I, and I did want to mention that there's so much information that we can share today verbally, but if you go to our website, you'll find all this information, and it's really intense with keys, and very good descriptions of the species, their flowers, even their seed types and a dichotomous key. So don't forget that. A big deal for us was actually having a place to grow them. So I'll tell the story a little bit later about Polly having to grow them right in the ground, which isn't ideal, but it's certainly a good way to do it if you don't have a greenhouse. But the development of this greenhouse and nursery in 2007 there's a picture I think of today. And now today, which is expanded, has really given us the capacity to grow these plants in more controlled conditions. And we'll also show you some refrigeration techniques that we use, which we did not have before that aid in germination and other ways of growing them. I'm gonna tell you a little bit, just run through this, not to go into detail, but essentially building the greenhouse and devoting ourselves to plant exploration was kind of have to build the capacity to do it. So the greenhouse was one of them. And then all these connections. So the very first Stewardius collected were in 2007. We started out with Stewardio Veda, and that was with uh, Mount Cuba in the Birmingham Botanic Garden. We really didn't focus on malacodendron, which we're going to talk about tonight, the silky stewardia, until 2009. And then we've had a series of trips all through that include Japan with the Asiatic ones, our most recent trip in 2021. One thing I wanted to tell you is like we love stewardias, but it also happens to be a place where great native azalea species are about 19 or 20 species throughout these southeastern areas. And we did see quite a few and got some seed this year of the azalea. So it's kind of a, a, a twofold thing, but mostly stewardia. 
Here's the first working group. Um, I'll talk about Jack Johnston later in detail, but that's Fred Spicer. He's the director of the Chicago Botanic Garden now. He was at the Birmingham Botanic Garden. He's a really great plantsman. He's one of those people who's gotten pulled into the bureaucratic morass, <laughs> but he's still a uh, great plants person. And then Ethan Guthrie, who's at the Atlanta Botanic Garden. Is it Smith Gall? Uh, well, no, I don't want to Okay. Okay. He's, he's at the country site of Atlanta Botanic Garden. Um, and he, we saw him at the end of our trip. He's pictured there on the right. And that's Jack Johnston in his element. Uh, just briefly about Jack, he's known by many as the Stewardia Whisperer. Uh, Liz will talk about it a little bit later. He has an uncanny way of looking in a mixed canopy of very similar trees, including Oxidendrum and some others, where it's really hard to discern Stewardia ovata in particular, but it doesn't matter. He can look at a forest ravine or an edge and pretty much find them or knows the exposure exactly where they'll be when you travel to a new site. So he's just a magnificent person, incredible individual that um, we've known since 2007. Um, we also wanted to take the time to thank the people who made this trip possible. So first of all, the Plant Collecting Collaborative, that's a group of um, botanical gardens and arboretum around the U.S., like uh, Chicago Botanic Garden, National Arboretum, the Morris Arboretum, the Morton Arboretum, um, and a whole list of others that, through um, a paid membership, basically, you then have access to request funds to help fund some of your plant collecting trips. And then um, members of the group can share germ plasm with each other. So they helped fund this trip. They funded about half of our trip. So we're really grateful for that. And then I won't go through this whole list now because you'll be meeting all of these people through our presentation. But um, we had many guys and many people who helped us with permitting and um, general logistics. So it is definitely a team effort that goes way beyond just Polly Hill. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, let's see. So um, part of having a PCA national collection is having a really detailed collection development plan. So when we were planning this trip, we wanted to go back to our um, development plan to help us target where we should collect germ plasm next. And what you see in front of you is a map that our previous curator, Todd Rounsville, had put together. And where you see that sweep of blue is the native range of... This map was put together by our previous curator, Todd Rounsville. And where you can see that sweep of blue is the native range of Stewardia malacodendron. And then the green is Stewardia oveda's natural range. And then any of the dots that you see um, is where we had um, collect, where we have accessions um, that we had collected germplasm from those specific areas. And so he put this together in 2019. So it's changed a little bit, but you can see, I'm not going to read it, but in this objective for our development plan, it says that we really want to, um, moving forward, start collecting from the periphery of the ranges, and especially uh, the southernmost and coastal populations, because they're the most at risk. So that's sort of what we used as a guide for um, what we call our flow geo trip, since we did Florida and Georgia primarily with um, a bit of collecting in Alabama. So this is a map that I made, and um, all of the black and the gray dots is where we already had germplasm before the trip. And what you see in the red is where we ended up collecting germplasm um, on our flow geo trip. 
So currently we have 30 total accessions of Swartium allocadendrin, and of those, 28 are individual um, wild collected um, accessions. And then of those 28 accessions, 14 of them were collected in our flow geotrip, so about half of all of our wild collected Swartia accessions were from this trip that we just took. And then you can see for Oveda, we have 24 total accessions. Of those 24, 20 are from um, collecting trips. And um, of those 20, eight of them were from this trip that we just took. And you can see where all of those red spots are. They are each sort of at the periphery and at the southernmost range of um, their natural uh, native range. So first we targeted the Stewardia malacodendron and um, we first traveled to the Florida Panhandle. And our first stop was Torreya State Park, which is about 14,000 acres on the Apalachicola River. And there's 11 natural communities there, um, mostly Sand Hill, which um, a lot is in pine plantations of sand pine, um, and upland and slope forest. And it's home to several endangered species, um, including Torreya taxifolia, which it is named for. So this is a picture that was taken in 2007 um, from Torreya State Park, and I took this from the Wikipedia page. And one of the reasons we really wanted to target these Gulf Coast populations is because hurricanes have been intensifying like crazy in both um, severity and in frequency. And so this was a picture, like I said, taken in 2007. This is a picture taken in 2018 after Hurricane Michael went through. And I took this from a Troy State Park's website. So you can see why it's important to target these uh, areas because literally in the matter of a few hours, um, all of that germ plasm and uh, diversity from those populations could be lost. We didn't actually end up collecting any Stewardia at the site, but I just wanted to show you that because I think it's really important for framing like why we wanted to target this area. And so um, here you can see Ron Lance. Uh, he's with the North Carolina Land Trust and we were checking out some oaks with him. And he has been to Torreya State Park and camped here many times in the past. And this was his first time since the hurricane. And this very sunny area that we're walking through right now, he said used to be closed canopy forest, which is just crazy. Um, here you can see all of that is uh, dog fennel, which is, um, it comes in after there's been a disturbance. So it was almost like walking through a forest of dog fennel at that point, which was <laughs> interesting. <laughs> but it was just crazy to see. So the next day we went to Lake Palquin State Forest, which is 19,000 acres in total, but we concentrated on what is called the Joe Bud Wild Ma um, Wildlife Management Area, which is about 11,000 acres. Um, and that area, it's a lot of upland hardwood and upland pine. And there used to be more upland pine and sand hill there, but um, after years of not having any sort of uh, fire regime happening, uh, those latter two communities um, became really degraded. And so like the history of the property is it was basically um, all cattle and timber from the 50s through the 70s. And then it just kind of sat there with no disturbance for a while. So there's sort of a mosaic of that upland hardwood and then um, some upland pine and sand hill, some of which is still degraded and some of which they're working on restoring to um, longleaf pine and wiregrass habitat. 
So uh, here is, uh, I'm in the middle, Tim is to my right, well, I guess to my left, depending on how you look at it, Tim's in the blue, all sweaty. <laughs> and then um, the smiley man in the pink is Mike Jenkins, and he works with the forest floor, the Florida Forest Service, and he's just an incredible guy. He helped us out a lot in planning um, and connecting us with people in the Florida Panhandle. And he's the one who guided us to the populations in Lake Talquin because we had to park and we had to hike for a while. So where we're standing now is definitely not Stewardia habitat, but this is an example of sort of um, some of the upland pine and sand hill that they're starting to restore. So all of this is longleaf pine that um, they had planted. And then this is just an, another example of that super open habitat that we were walking through. And there were, um, you can see here some lichris. Um, there's a lot of hypericum, more dog fennel, which we saw a lot of all through everywhere we went in Florida. Um, and I think in Alabama too. Yeah. <laughs> and um, some blue curls. And this right here is um, some gopher turtle. Uh, burrows, uh, or so, I'm sorry, gopher tortoise, there is a difference. Yeah. Um, so gopher tortoise, um, their burrows provide shelter for over 360 animals, and they are an IUCN red list as a globally vulnerable species. So um, restoring this habitat is very important both for them and all of the other creatures that depend on their burrows for their own um, habitat. And once we made it through these cleared areas, um, you know, this series of pictures is just to show you getting to the Stewardia habitat and um, the variety of communities that are found on this property. So right here, um, we're starting to go down one of the ravines where you tend to find um, Stewardia, they really like to be on um, moist slopes and um, the, the edges of ravines. So here, here's Mike going on down. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but sort of in the mid foreground here is a bunch of horse sugar, which is a woody plant um, that we saw both in Florida and in Georgia and probably in Alabama too, seems to be everywhere. And then we started getting into this sort of upland uh, mixed or hardwood forest here where there was Florida maple, Polesia Carolina, hickory, persimmon, uh, spruce pine, pignut hickory, southern magnolia, tulip tree, white oak, and other oaks. And a lot of these species we would see throughout our trip especially the Southern Magnolia in all of our Southern sites. So this is where we really started to harvest Stewardia fruits at uh, Lake Talquin. You can see um, Bob Farley to the right is someone who Mike had introduced us to, and you'll see him at our next site uh, that we went to the following day. But this is pretty typical of um, where we would uh, find the Stewardia at Lake Talquin. And you can see it's, um, you know, where they're standing, it's maybe a little shady, but you can see there's a light coming through there. So um, when you find trees under light gaps, that's really where you're going to find, um, you have the best luck of finding fruit. It looks like Mike is standing under a Stewardia. He is, yep. Yeah, where you can see the branches kind of arcing out mm -hmm. into the sun. So it's a key feature. Here's Tim harvesting some fruits. Looks like that guy gets some good light. Um, and this is just uh, another sort of example of what beauty is at this site. It looks like an acidic sort of stream. And you're often gonna find Stewardia growing towards um, near streams. I think Mike had told us that, that site hadn't been revisited in six years or something like that. And so when we have the data points that he gave us, they're very happy that we actually, you know, we're going back to 
checked on plants. We, we did collect a lot in light gaps, but we also found a lot of trees in deep shade that didn't have fruit. So at this next site, um, we're not going to be super specific about the name or the location, other than that it's in Washington County because it is not on protected land and it's really easily accessible. And Bob Farley, who's sort of an amateur botanist in the area who Mike had introduced us to, is the one who sort of um, introduced us to this population. And he was telling us a story about how in, I think it was the same county, he had found a population of an extremely rare sundew. Like there may be only a couple populations in the world. And he reported it to the county commissioner um, who then pulled some strings to um, destroy the population. When Bob revisited it a couple months later after reporting it, it had been completely like mowed over into oblivion. So um, sometimes it's hard to know who to trust with this information and it makes these species really hard to protect. So, because you don't have to walk miles to this, I'm just going to call it the Washington County population. So, this is um, a satellite image of this area. And it was really trippy because rather than having to hike like a mile into the forest, we literally were led by Bob down miles and miles of roads that had been laid for a subdivision, which had never been created. So no houses ended up going up. Um, so there's just, you can see here, there's two cul-de-sacs, but there's no houses. It's crazy. And in this area of Florida in general, there's hundreds of miles like this where developers bought up land, put down roads, and then the projects fell through and it just sits there. So there's a lot of sinkholes in this area, and this population is actually um, on a slope going down into this sinkhole. And I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but just um, ahead of the sinkhole, you can see the slope is sort of um, completely eroded, and that's because it's a party site. So people are constantly, you know, driving trucks and ATVs down, and... Um, there's literally like less than zero protection here. But on the shadier side of the slope, um, thankfully people have left it alone so far and we found an amazing abundance of fruit. And this was actually like our superstar site of our entire trip. It was completely amazing. One thing that was super cool about it is it was a very open canopy which um, is kind of rare for our stewardia hunting because they're, you know, they're an understory species and they're usually in a forest and you would be kind of hard pressed to call this a forest. So, you know, we just parked at the side of the road and then this is, you know, you can see the road right there. So as we're walking in, this is called woody goldenrod, though it's not exactly a goldenrod uh, Species. It's in the same family. It's um, Chrysoma passiflosculosa. I hope mm -hmm. I said that correctly, but I thought it was pretty cool. Um, and then maybe a hundred feet away, well, a hundred feet away from that and from this was our Stewardia population. But this just goes to show how uh, dry it is there. That woody goldenrod that I showed you, um, it likes pretty xeric sites. And then here you see this reindeer moss. Um, not many reindeer in Florida, but <laughs> I'm sure uh, a lot of you listening know that reindeer moss is actually a lichen, but um, it was really cool to see this. It's almost like snow in Florida. And then this was the first Stordia tree that we saw. And you can see uh, the water of the sinkhole uh, in the background there and just how open and sunny the site is. So this was at the top of the slope. And then here's Bob, and um, this is just to kind of show you more of the open aspect of the site. And this also is just um, to show you sort of the character. You can see that it looks a lot different from <clears throat> the Lake Telquin site. 
So here there is um, a lot of vaccinium arboreum, again, southern magnolia, laurel oak, live oak, beauty berry, pignut hickory, uh, plants like that. You can kind of see a little stewardia all the way to the left there poking in. Um, this is a little hard to see. And in general, it was really hard this trip to get good pictures of stewardia trees just because there's always so many other things growing all around that it's hard for the camera to sort of focus on it. But this is, if you can see it, um, there's all these yellowish green balls that look kind of like crab apples hanging all over this tree. And it is just covered. This is just to show the abundance of fruit. Sometimes you'll find a tree like at Lake Talquin, we would find sometimes maybe only a couple of fruits on a tree. And mm -hmm. then, you know, we would maybe not harvest them or there might be, you know, 15 fruits on a tree. These would have hundreds of fruits on a tree. And um, it's likely that all of the sun was just giving the trees enough energy to produce. And not only were they um, abundant, but they were also humongous. So this again, like it's actually a little blurry, but you can kind of see how large these fruits are. And then this is just a close up of uh, what they look like, very green and juicy. Yeah, these are, in my mind, I haven't collected these for another 15 years now. They're on average a quarter to a half inch larger than any fruits we've ever come across. And the curious thing is, the question is, well, how big are the flowers? If the fruits are this big, it's not necessarily a correlation, but just the size, the sheer size, and then as Liz, Liz said, the abundance, I just, that was, we were completely looking at each other like it was the greatest bonanza of, of our lives. <laughs> We would have liked to spend more time there, but we actually had another appointment um, that afternoon. So we drove um, much further west into the Panhandle, into Santa Rosa County. And again, I'm going to be kind of vague about our location here because um, we went to a couple sites and both of them were pretty easy to just drive right up to and park and sort of get into. And... Um, Stewardia malacodendron is a state endangered species in Florida, so we just want to be careful um, with this specific locality information. Um, so the man that we are about to introduce, Ron Miller, if you kind of want to take it away, Tim, for a minute here. Yeah, so Ron, I've known for probably 20 years through Azalea love letters, I'll call them. Uh, he is a retired professor from the Pensacola area in Romance Languages, actually. And before that, he had told us he was very involved with biochemistry and geophysics. He has spent his entire retirement and before uh, going down the rivers and uh, different areas in Florida where all these rivers kind of coalesce and collide, looking at the riverbanks, mostly for azalea. So not only is he kind of a, a field specialist, but he's also a person who's discovered new species. And one in particular, Rhododendron colmanii, which was described relatively recently he had a lot to do with that. So in terms of knowing diversity, he's really, really the azalea expert of the Southeast. And it's rare when you find somebody so devoted, so passionate like Jack Johnston and others that they do this for a living. So um, I would say he's an interesting guy. <laughs> he has a lot of stories. And we went out into uh, the forest with him and, and, and learned a lot from Ron. So there's Ron in the black shirt there talking to Tim. And this was the first site that we met him at. And um, this was also kind of an unusual site for Stewardia because it was so flat. It had pretty much zero slope to it. And um, you normally, like I mentioned before, they're normally um, on pretty steep slopes and even like the, uh, on the edges of ravines. Um, but here you could just 
walk right over to him pretty easily from uh, the parking lot of a boat ramp, actually. Um, there was um, some hamamelis, some witch hazel at this site. And right here is Ron showing us, um, to the left is hamamelis um, virginiana. And to the right is a leaf of uh, what he believes to be hamamelis ovalis, which is um, sort of a rare witch hazel. Um, and uh, he was describing to us that you can sort of tell the difference by looking at the leaves. And he describes the ovalis on the right as having almost like a gunmetal gray sort of cast to it. And the underside of the leaves are, are fuzzier and, and sometimes have these brownish hairs near the veins. And you can see here, I mean, leaf size is, is extremely variable, but um, they tend to also be maybe a little bit bigger. Yes, this is a species recently described. And I, when I say that, the early 2000s in Alabama, but now because of kind of this determination of looking at it, Virginiana typically like we find is a fall bloomer. This one down there blooms in January. Um, it's slightly, it has more variation in color than Virginiana. They have pinks and kind of bronze flowers. So it's a, it's a new species relatively. And we have a, a couple different accessions here at Poly Hill from wild sources. A roadside um, from one site to another that we decided to pull over and we grabbed some uh, Vernonia seed. But this just shows you, um, you can see the diversity of the herbaceous plants growing here. Um, there was agave virginica, like I said, Vernonia, Eryngia, there's Ilex vomitoria, uh, Andropogon. Um, a beautiful hibiscus that you can see here, hibiscus peculiata, which we collected some seed of. Um, and you can see up here on the bud, some love bugs. And right here, um, I grew up in Florida and anyone who's traveled to Florida this time of year would be familiar with the love bug phenomenon. <laughs> So after we went to those sites on the same day, we went to Blackwater River State Forest. So this state forest is 207,000 acres, um, but we sort of just explored a spot that's in the west, southwest area of the park. Um, so Blackwater River State Forest, it has um, around 10 plant communities, has a lot of upland pine and sand hill, but it also has wet flatwoods and bottomland forest and floodplain swamp and all the variations in between. So you can see this looks um, different than any of the other sites that we went to. Um, as we were walking in, there was um, a lot of longleaf pine, bracken fern, baptisia, uh, I think this is lanceolata, wiregrass, vaccinium darii, also known as farkle, or no, that's not farkle bear, that's our boring, never mind. We didn't see that too, just not at this site. Um, and then, uh, well, this is a classic picture of Ron <laughs> uh, Miller that I had to include. <laughs> yeah, this is where Ron, we started to wonder if we might have to dig a hole nearby if we didn't make it back to his truck because it was getting dark simultaneously driving there the you know five hours or whatever we didn't get a lot to eat so we were pretty hungry if we let ron keep leading us further on we probably would have hit nightfall but we turned around but uh mm -hmm. this was one way to bond nice by just sitting on the side of the hill here this is um, sort of a classic type photo of Ron, and anyone who's been out collecting with him is, probably has a similar photo. So, um, but you can see, just as with the other sites, um, the plant community would sort of shift as you got into these um, 
micro sites. And uh, here it was, it's a lot more um, open with less sort of um, short woody stuff growing. And you can see there's some orchids popping up. Um, I believe were, these ones were a platanthera too, yeah. I think, yeah. And you can see where there were some wet areas as well, um, like where the vegetation changes in that um, sort of strip right there, a little stream. Here um, to the left is a plant that is always exciting to stumble upon, and that is the flame flower which is another globally vulnerable and state imperiled plant. Um, and then to the right is another Platanthera uh, orchid that I'm, I'm not sure what the species is off the top of my head. The orange Platanthera. And then this, it's a little hard to see, but there was a ton of that um, flame flower growing all around this sort of wet edge. This is Calmia hirsuta, which is, you can see that's like a grass and pine needles around it. It's a really low growing Calmia, which is cool to see because I've only really seen them in like larger shrub forms. And um, a bit later on in Georgia, we'll see some uh, Calmia latifolia, which um, looks nothing like Calmia hirsuta. And then here, there was a lot of rhododendron uh, viscosum you can see on the left there. And then to the right is just one of the uh, liatra species. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head which one this was, but we saw a huge diversity of liatris on this trip. So next we headed up into Alabama to the Solon Dixon Forestry Education Center. So this is um, a property that is managed by Auburn University. And this is where they take forestry students to sort of hands-on learn in the field. And they conduct experiments here. And they have a really nice um, like conference center and auditorium. And we actually stayed here in some, I don't know what you would call them, not quite dorms but yeah, they're like re research houses they're yeah really quite comfortable and um oh I forgot I put this one in there if you want yeah to. I did I was going to mention that one thing before we left on this trip you know Liz, Liz did incredible amounts of itinerary um scheduling and setting up all the botanist and it's it's a lot a lot of work but we were notified of this book called Southern Wonder, Alabama's Surprising Biodiversity by Scott Duncan. And it, it's, it has a foreword from E.O. Wilson, who passed away just last year, who's a native of Alabama. But it details kind of what we would call the, the geological past history, but also kind of the history, natural history of Alabama and why, particularly in the southern half of it, it's so rich and wonderful diversity. The one thing that is very challenging, and this also includes Florida, is beyond the areas that are preserved forever, which are magical and essential, there's all kinds of areas that are open to future development. So it's kind of sad they have very lax environmental laws in Alabama and Florida. Um, this book goes into it and it goes through kind of the history of environmentalism, uh, conservation and the struggles of today. So it's just one additional reason why it's kind of a theme today. We should get into these areas, particularly when they're new and unexplored. This book's worth reading if you get a chance. So we brought Ron Miller with us uh, to Alabama for the first day because we were getting together with a plant posse that you'll see in the next slide. And then Ron Lance also met back up with us. And I'm really proud of myself for taking this picture of the meeting of the Rons because they're both um, very like renowned plant people. 
and they'd never met before, but they have a lot of mutual colleagues. Yeah. So this was kind of a fun moment. <laughs> yeah, Ron Lance on the left is the former Southeast Oak expert in, in the country. He was a past president of the Oak Society. I met him in the year 2000 at a meeting in Asheville, and he was living there at the time, but he has really an encyclopedic knowledge of the differences, the minute differences between oak species, but secondarily also loves azaleas. So he and Ron have kind of, you know, never met, but have crossed paths in the literature. Uh, Ron Lance, I'll also mention, is into hawthorns. So he wrote, <laughs> wrote a book on hawthorns, which, is, which really means you're devoted to esoteria but he is just a wonderful colleague, um, so kind and supportive. So um, this was our all-star plant crew. Uh, from the left, you all know Ron Miller now. And then next to him is Tony Aiello and uh, Peter Zale. They both work, with, uh, work at Longwood Gardens. And then uh, Tim and I, Curtis Hansen is standing next to me, and he is from um, Auburn's Herbarium. I, it's the Freeman, the Freeman Herbarium, and um, he actually wrote the floor of Solon Dixon. And I sort of um, serendipitously met him a few months before our trip online. We were both taking uh, an her herbarium strategic planning course. And um, I saw there was Stewardia listed as being at Solon Dixon and also some of the oak that we were targeting with Ron. So um, he kind of got roped into guiding this whole group for a couple of days, which was very generous of him. And he was very awesome. And then Ron Lance next to him. And then that guy standing at the end is Patrick Thompson. And so he is at the, um, the Donald Davis Arboretum um, at Auburn. And you're gonna see him coming up in these slides. And he does a lot of work with endangered oaks and he's the one who's coming to Polly Hill June 29th to speak. And everyone who can should definitely come check that out. So um, Solon Dixon Center, it borders the Konica National Forest and it has a huge diversity of habitat. And I'm gonna kind of fly through some of this because um, we still have sort of a lot to get through, but this is a beautiful limestone stream that we checked out when we first got there. That's uh, Ron Lance getting close and personal with a hand lens on something. Uh, Tupelo swamps. This is a sort of walking through, I don't know how you would characterize this forest, but um, with an open canopy. Yeah. Beautiful. This was a roadside that we all had to stop at because it was so beautiful. That's Patrick Thompson taking some pictures. You can see the blue curls that I mentioned earlier in the foreground there. This is, uh, I guess, from Patrick's point of view, um, some pretty, looks like Solidago. This is um, Peter Zell there and Patrick Thompson. After we went to those sites, so we were at the limestone site, the Tupelo Swamp, and now we're heading up to a a scrubby community um, that was sort of on a loose sand substrate over iron encrusted sandstone, which was an interesting, you can yeah. see, look how different this is from anywhere else that we went. You can see, um, what is that, turkey oak? Yeah. And um, some Apuntia cactus down here. Um, there was also Aristida and gopher apple and sand post oak and prairie tea, which is a croton. Um, be careful where you step. Um, this is Ron Lance helping me get um, a little Apuntia cactus out of my socks. <laughs> and I think there too, you can see some of the gopher apple growing. Um, 
not surprisingly, go for tortoises being off of go for apples. This is at that same site, that's Curtis and Tim. Uh, we collected some seed off of this Amsonia ciliata. And then yet another site that we went to in Alabama, that's Ron Lance. I'm like, I guess his personal paparazzi. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so this was at a limestone karst outcrop, um, which was really cool. And we collected here some seed of hydrangea quercifolia. And then how could we forget, um, this was a cypress swamp that we visited and I mean, it was just, it was really magical and stunning. But we have not even gotten to the most incredible part of Alabama uh, that we saw, which was this bog that was at the Konica National Forest. And we didn't collect anything here, but one of Patrick Thompson's good friends, Jimmy Stiles, uh, took us here. So at first sight, doesn't look too crazy, but then you walk in and I like, we, it was like, we were drunk walking around this yeah. place. Like the mosquitoes were covering our faces, uh, before we left because I mean, it was like Dorothy in the poppy fields. The diversity was just crazy. Um, it obviously was impossible to capture in pictures, but there was like a beautiful yellow, like maybe a tiger swallowtail butterfly, like flitting around all of this purple liatris up against these yellow pitcher plants. Um, wow. This is just to show some of the diversity. You can see the, the grasses and the um, eryngium, is that what it? Yeah. Um, and the liatris and, and all of this. I'll, the, the more you look, the more you see, like looking at the night sky. It was pretty much, if you did like a 10 by 10 little quadrant and looked at it, you would just find hundreds of species. And when we were there, there were a few, I think, invertebrate ecologists looking at the insect diversity, which is incredible. It really, it was, I, I want to go back to this place. I have to now. Yeah, um, herpetologist dream. Um, and this is just another photo, just to show like, oh, like every corner of this bog was just incredible. And I loved all the asters growing up with, with all of the pitcher plants. And uh, there were also some crazy thread leaf sundews. This is Patrick Thompson, look how happy he is. We were all just, like I said, <laughs> um, just so stoked. And then um, the next day, we went up and checked out uh, Patrick's uh, digs at his arboretum. And so they have a huge bog garden there. And this is um, a picture of me and Patrick sort of in their uh, greenhouse here where they propagate their um, bog plants, some of which I think are quite rare. All right. Now I really got to fly through. So that was our last um, Southern coastal site. And then we went up to Northeastern Georgia to look for Swartio Veda, which um, yeah, definitely grows at higher elevations than uh, Swartia uh, pseudocamel or malacodendron, sorry. Yeah, so we had been to a lot of these rivers before where the the loosely named Swartia uh, working group. And we were led almost every time by Jack uh, Johnston. And you can see one river off to the right, the Alatmaha River. That is the last known site of Frank Linnea. So Frank Linnea was discovered uh, not far off that river, actually in South Carolina as it crosses the border. Um, but the Oguchi River, uh, the Chattahoochee up above, and those others, the Coosa and the Chattooga are river systems that I've been to with Jack. Uh, Jack lives in northern uh, Georgia in a, a town called Clayton. I should mention that Jack's profession, he just retired last year, was a male nurse at a very small 
Country Hospital just outside of Clayton. So he's a man of great patience and kindness. And so he is pretty much our guide from this point on um, as we go to look for the mountain camellia. Our next um, site, there are actually a couple of them, but they were pretty close together. And um, they were both um, in and around the Chattahoochee National Forest. And so uh, one of them was, was a Smith Ballwood State Park, which is about 5,000 acres, a hardwood forest known for its trout streams, and Chastity uh, Wildlife Management Area, which is like officially part of the Chattahoochee National Forest. And that is about 27,000 acres. So we met up with Jack in the parking lot. Yeah, I hadn't seen Jack in, uh, you know, four years or so. And uh, so it was a great meeting. And I'll let Liz tell you a little bit about this unusual yeah. gift that he brought us. So Jack is known for his uh, Stewardius uh, harvesting sticks, which uh, these were made out of sourwood. And it's basically um, a branch that has a smaller twig coming off that you can use as a hook so that you can reach up to taller branches of a swordia tree and bend it down with the hook um, so that it doesn't snap. And then it allows you to hold the hook with one hand that's sort of bowing the branch down. And then with your other hand, you collect the swordia fruit. Sort of like that. If you can see there in the foreground, there's Jack giving me the look as he's like, what are you doing? As I'm trying to take a picture as I'm sort of uh, hooking the Stordia branch down. You can see though, look at that in kind of, you know, a little bit of a dark forest and a, and a mountain ravine. It's kind of hard to see the fruits. You see them peeking out there. They're kind of pointed, but uncannily, he can just take and scour and say, and he has a very lovely Alabama voice. He's from Alabama. Well, there they are. <laughs> All right, we got four minutes. I'm really going to rush. Um, this is Will Wagner. He's the manager of Smith Goal. And um, he was really kind to us and um, basically gave us the whole lay of the land and took us to one sorority tree, which just so happened to be right behind their uh, visitor center off of the staff road. Um, so when we were driving, we were kind of using our GPS and looking at topo maps. And we first pulled off here and Jack was quick to tell us that when you see this much Calmia latifolia, um, it's probably gonna be too dry to find Stewardia. And that the most common associates in this region are usually hemlock and red maple. But nevertheless, we parked here and this is where we entered the forest. Um, you can see we got deeper in, um, there's some Stewardia in front of us, but it kind of just looks like every other nondescript green tree. Um, this is more just to show sort of, um, what the plant community was like. There was a lot of, uh, like rhododendron maximum there, um, some other types of magnolia, hemlock. Yep. Um, Yep, some beautiful waterfalls. Another Stewardia tree, you can see how lush it is in there. Um, there's just some associated species, some Tiarella, um, some Acerum. Uh, there was also a lot of rattlesnake plantain, the Gudiera orchid rosettes that we were seeing, some Monotropa here, and what is that, the Tella yeah. that is? Um, we also harvested some seed here of uh, Euonymus, American Euonymus, which have really beautiful fruits. Um, now to get into the seeds, just real quick. Yeah, so this uh, what you have the seeds, one of the key things is to not let them dry out as these individual seeds of a beta, they're like a little oat flake. That dark center is the actual seed and has a wing. That wing may aid in its transportation along river corridors where they're native. Uh, but if that seed becomes more sclerified or what we call woody, the longer it takes later on when you're trying to germinate it 
to get it active, to break through that woody tissue, to get the processes going. So it can have a one year, three year, or five year germination uh, dormancy. Um, all of our Stewardia Oveda accessions that we're kind of letting have a little breather before we pack them back up and ship them home. Um, so each pile here is a different um, collection or accession. Um, this is, you know, you saw them in this, they look, you know, they're nice and green when we harvested them. We did let them dry a little bit. And then um, this is what they looked like by the time I was removing the seed. And you can see the seeds here after I cracked it open a little bit um, with some pliers, you can see where they sort of lay inside the fruit. And then um, to the left here, you can see a comparison between the Swordio Veda fruits on the top and the Malacodendron fruits on the bottom, or I'm sorry, seeds. Um, the, I've got to say, I process all of the seed and I much prefer processing the Malacodendron seeds um, the fruits are over here to the right, and they are much easier to sort of split open, which you do with the plier, and they just fall right out, which is not the case for Oveda. Um, and then I know we're pretty much out of time, and we'll take questions soon, but one of the reasons that we like to grow things from seed, not only for the conservation value, but also you get a lot of variation in... Um, flower uh, colors um, with the, the markings on the petals um, with that greater um, genetic diversity that you get growing from seed rather than just cloning a plant. I'll give you this very quickly, but one thing that we found in the wild is um, when trees are by themselves, they can pollinate themselves, but they don't have as much seed produced. They're self-fertile, but they don't produce as much if they're in a healthy population, which we found, particularly that population in uh, the panhandle, uh, they can be loaded with fruit if they're not fragmented. Um, trees can suffer from drought, not produce much seed. That's, that happens. Trees can get crushed by, by hurricanes of 165 mile an hour winds that we saw. Populations that are cut don't do that well or that are burned and then what happens if you dam a riparian corridor and make it an artificial corridor? The flooding events can drown the trees. So these are problems along the way that Stewardia suffers from. I go back though to Polly who, who didn't have a greenhouse and would sow, sow them right in the ground because of their long stratification period. Uh, three to five months. So the first time when we went to Alabama, Malacodendron and Oveda, when we had, went to Georgia, I just planted them in the ground in the old nursery like Polly. And what we discovered, if you go to the next slide, is we had sporadic germination. Uh, they sprouted in these beds over a three-year period, some right away, some took three years and then maybe four. But we do have the advantage now of dormancy controls that are in our basement of the EBL. So this is the first time we've ever counted the seeds per lot, per flat, and sowed them in straight 40 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll leave them there. I think it's going to be about four months total. So they'll come out in like mid-April and we'll put them in the greenhouse. We expect to have a lot of success. And here they are from past trips. They're cute when you transplant them. Look at that. Here they Beautiful. are. I mean, there's tons of uh, Malacodendron Oveda. We're just showing off. Yeah. So this is what we hope for. What's next? Well, talk about all those stars. <laughs> so this is finished recorded occurrences of Stewardia Malacodendron in, the, in Florida. And so Tim and I are taking another trip next month to survey more populations that we didn't see before uh, for future seed collecting trips. So we're very excited. I have to say, to be able to go when they're in flower, which after like 15 to 20 years of work, working with them, instead of really kind of trying to find the seed, uh, if we can capture them in flower, do some comparisons, we're going to be able to discover and map new populations, which is really exciting. 
anyways, thank you guys for joining us. And we hope that you enjoyed our pictures and found it interesting or entertaining, <laughs> at least. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you for sharing. Um, all right, let me see if I can get um, Tim and Liz's video. Also, we on. apologize if you couldn't hear us at times. We didn't realize that um, we were being too quiet because we couldn't see the chat if anyone said that in the chat. But we tried our best after Liz uh, told us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so sorry yeah so sorry about the technical issues um thank you liz and tim for doing your best to try and share the mic um thank you all for sticking through it if there were parts where it was a little bit garbled um uh but yeah thank you so much tim and liz those were really beautiful pictures um, and it was really fun to hear your stories um so if you have questions we can take a few minutes for questions um put them in the q a box um and i'll answer them i see a bunch of nice notes in the chat in the q a um so thank you all for your shout outs and um i'll save those so tim and liz can look at them um so yeah thank you all for joining um I wanted to ask, um, as people are, if you are thinking of questions in the next couple of minutes, um, Tim and Liz, I know you talked a little bit about what's next, and I know that you're planning on going back to Florida, um, and I'm wondering, like, what areas you're going to go back to? Um, we're going to go to, uh, Eglin Air Force Base, which apparently has just amazing, huge Stewardia populations. We wanted to go there this last trip, but we couldn't get, um, a collecting permit. So we're not collecting seed this time. So we're going to at least just like go check them out and take some vouchers. We're also going to go back to that Washington County area because there's a lot of other um, populations around there, which are just like scattered all along other sinkholes and streams. So we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. Cool. All right. So there's um, a question about, um, will Stewardia grow in Northeastern Massachusetts? Hmm. Well, yeah, that's your best. Best location might be coastal. Tim, um, can you move a little closer? <laughs> sure. I, I think really it would need protection, and you would probably have more luck in a maritime type situation like we are. Coastal, they're zone 7A, um, 6B sometimes, but knowing that the Arnold has really had struggles, I would say it's it's going to be um, somewhat challenging, but not impossible. Maybe one of the Asian stewardias, though. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You could grow the small stewardia monodelpha or certainly pseudo camellia. Both of those are hardy. Okay, great. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Tim and Liz, and thank you, everyone, for joining um hopefully you'll be able to join one of our webinars in april too um and again yeah feel free to email me with any questions all right so thank you everyone and thanks everybody thanks thanks liz for setting this up